Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. Uh, today, helping children improve their ability to read social cues, such as facial expressions, as well as helping children better engage and work with others is what we're talking about. These are critical skills and formidable challenges for many of our children with attention deficit disorder, with autism spectrum disorders, and any number of other ancillary conditions. We'll be talking with Anna Vagan, PhD, who will be discussing how to use YouTube videos, our, our all of our children's favorite um, channel, YouTube, as social learning material for your child, including how to jumpstart discussions about feelings, how to encourage your child to think about their social behavior, and how to include social learning as part of the family's daily dialogue. She is, Anna Vagan is a PhD, a speech and language pathologist with over 30 years experience consulting with parents and schools on diagnoses such as ASD, ADHD, and anxiety disorders, frequent speaker in the US and Canada, and the author of a number of important books on social learning. She has a terrific website, socialtime.org, with many resources, including her YouTube video recommendations um, spelled out. So be sure to check that out. Um, support for this Attitude broadcast comes from Play Attention. Play Attention is the leader in customized neurocognitive training and executive function in self-regulation, and it offers an exceptional social skills module. Social skills don't come naturally to kids with ADHD, and their friendship challenges can be heartbreaking. Play Attention understands. You can schedule a free professional consult today with Play Attention by calling 800-788-6786. That's 1-800-788-6786, www.playattention.com. Play Attention is actually making a wonderful offer to Attitude Broadcast participants, a $200 discount. Mention the code ADDMAG, ADDMAG0808, and you'll receive the Play Attention Social Skills module for free. So before Anna Vagan begins to speak, we want to ask our listeners to tell us about your child's biggest challenge with cooperation. Um, is it being flexible? Is it understanding other people's feelings? Is it sticking with and not giving up? Is it listening and going along with a group? So please take our poll. And while you are doing that, I will tell you a little bit about this new platform that we are using. The widgets are resizable and movable. Feel free to move them around your screen. Um, submit your questions to the Q&A widget that's visible on your screen to the right of the slide area. And lastly, most important, this webinar is streamed through your computer and there's no dial-in number. So it's very bandwidth intensive and we advise you to close any programs or browser sessions that might be running in the background. If, an, if your network is slow, the slides might lag. And if that happens, please try pushing F5 on your keyboard to refresh. For those of you who are listening to the podcast version of this, keep in mind that the slides, the accompanying slides are available on the Attitude website. When you have a moment, go to attitudemag.com and check the slides out. So, okay, let's see the poll results. Um, I'm actually not able to see that. So perhaps someone else could re say what those poll results are. Uh, well, being flexible is 21%. Understanding okay. other people's ideas and feelings is 31%. Sticking with it and not giving up, 20%. And listening and going along with the group got 26.7%. Wow, so all four areas are important, but um, understanding others' feelings or leading the pack, I guess that makes, that makes sense. Um, okay, with this, let me turn it over to Anna Vagan to, to give her presentation, and she'll be taking questions at the end of, of her presentation. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks so much, Susan. It's great to be with you today, and we're going to spend a little bit of time together talking about all of the issues that were just mentioned in the poll, but we're gonna focus on a surprisingly complicated social concept, which is cooperation. And cooperation requires a surprising number of skills. And so some of them, figuring out the task, of course you have to know what you're cooperating about, and then staying focused and on task. Keeping ourselves regulated is important. If we're too excited, cooperation may be challenging for us. If we're too bored or too tired, again, it's going to be difficult for us to stay active members of the group. 
flexibility, which was certainly on this poll, is a challenge because often when we cooperate, what we want, our basic ideas, our fabulous plans may not be what everyone wants to do. If we want to try and convince people to perhaps come along with our idea, we need to express our ideas in a friendly way. And then this last point, understanding feelings and perspectives of others, in the poll that we just saw, it's edging the other three out just a little bit. Because understanding feelings, our own feelings, but also the feelings of the people we're with is really, really critical. So it's not so easy to cooperate, but this is a skill that really when students are in school, it's kind of expected even at the kindergarten level. If we look at the core curriculum standards now, we have a lot of phrases about collaborate, participate in collaborative discussions, working in small groups, and that all require cooperation. So one of our questions today, our main question, is how can we use YouTube videos and also games, we're going to talk about some games toward the end of our time together, to build our students' cooperation cue, to build their ability to understand and be able to practice these difficult, challenging for many of our kiddos skills. So if we, if we talk about, well, what, what do we need to do to cooperate? It really depends on what the task is, where we are, and what we're doing. Because one situation may require a certain collection of cooperative strategies, and another situation might require a whole different set of skills. And so it's a real conglomeration. It's a real hodgepodge sometimes, but we certainly have to be patient and trust others. You know, often when I work with students and families, we'll sit and talk about what does it mean to cooperate? And it's always an interesting set of ideas, but trusting others and being patient is really one of the primary factors. We really have to give people time, whether they're coming up with their part of a school assignment or whether we're waiting for them to take a turn in a game. We sometimes have to kind of just sit there and wait. And waiting is, I think, a really, really tricky skill for many of our students with ADHD. Sticking with it and not giving up, a lot of cooperation factors in issues of resilience. Listening and going with the group. We have to be able to express our ideas when other people don't understand them, you know, and stay calm, not kind of jump on people if they didn't get our idea the first time through. Maybe it was just a complicated idea. We take a breath, we try and express it again in a friendly way, then we can, we can work together to get the job done. Managing our strong feelings. So it's not just understanding the feelings of other people who, with whom we're working. We have to really kind of keep track of our feelings. And this will come up when we talk about playing games. You know, we often think of games as being fun. They're not always fun. I mean, if I don't get Park Place when I'm playing Monopoly, I, I do have some uncomfortable feelings about that. We certainly have to understand other people's ideas and their feelings. Again, in, initially today that was coming up pretty high in the poll. Being flexible, you know, often our challenge in being flexible is that if we have to be flexible, sometimes we feel anxious about that. And we have to share the job. So let's, let's, look, let's talk about this a little bit further. When I work with social cognition with students with ADHD and other types of diagnoses, I often think about, well, you know, they, students are exposed to a social world. And for many of us and for many of our children, that social exposure and learning kind of go hand in hand. And there they are able to perform along a continuum, but they're able to get social relationships pretty much on track. They're able to succeed in these collaborative discussions in the classroom. But then the students and families with whom I'm working, for some reason, that social exposure has not been sufficient for them to be able to translate what they've learned about the world into social performance. And so then sometimes our job is to do that social learning, find that piece of teaching and breaking tasks down to bridge that gap between just naturalistic social exposure and then being able to perform. So a good question this morning is, why YouTube? Why do I like using YouTube so much? There's a number of reasons that I think that YouTube can provide socially engaging and relevant material for us to use. 
because to get the attention of a student, to get our kiddos' attentions, we have to be engaging. We have to provide them with something that's going to get their attention and get them to focus in. And so one of the great things about YouTube is it's fun. And most students, if I, you know, I have an office and kids come into my office, if I have a YouTube video ready to queue up, their eyes will just scan my office and boom, they found the monitor and they're like, oh, wow, YouTube. And so it's really going to be engaging. And we're going to talk about several YouTubes and I'll provide a link at the end where you can get even more recommendations of incredible videos that are easily available and that will really hook our kids in to having some of these really important discussions. You know, especially with school starting, already summer's almost over, we can start kind of reminding our children about factors of cooperation and how it helps. It's so helpful to kind of get, get a jump start on that. I recommend a lot of YouTube videos that don't have dialogue. And that's because I want my students to really focus in on the nonverbal information of many of these great stories. I find that if there's a dialogue, in some ways kids will just tune in and focus on the dialogue. And I want the students really paying attention to the visual information, to the contextual information of what's happening, and to the interpersonal information between characters, to facial expression, to gesture, to what's really happening non-verbally between the characters. Because often, this is what my students are missing in the real world. And so this is giving them great practice in paying attention to that. The great thing about YouTube is you can watch it over and over. It will always be exactly the same. And you can use that pause button to either freeze an expression and say, wow, look at that character. He looks so mad. Or to ask your, your child, what do, you, what do you think? What do you think he's thinking right there? Because often our students can really benefit from that pause time. Now, you can either ask your student what they think, your child, but you can also just watch it and talk about it yourself. You don't have to wait for your child to really want to participate. And that's what's so useful. In the kitchen, turn on a YouTube video and you can be watching it all by yourself. You might be laughing, you might be saying a little, little something about what you think. I bet your child will come over and see what you're looking at because that, their eyes are just gonna zero in and draw into that YouTube. It's a lot of fun and there's great stories, fabulous stories. There's a lot of junk, let's be honest. There's a lot of things on YouTube that are not for our kids, but there's a lot of incredibly well-crafted, beautifully realized stories that in four minutes tell an amazing story about relationships. Many of the YouTubes that I recommend are stories where resilience comes into play because let's be honest, a good story is when there are challenges and obstacles for characters to overcome whether it's a movie, whether it's a great book, or whether it's a YouTube video, a good story is about overcoming obstacles. And so we can feather in not just issues of cooperation, but also issues of resilience. What is it about this character that they were able to keep going when the going got tough? And of course, YouTube stories are about feelings. And again, it really resonates to me that in the poll that we just took, understanding feelings, other people's ideas and feelings, was edging out the other three factors just by a little bit. Many, many, in fact, most of the students with whom I work, whether they're five years old or whether they're 30 years old, really are working with how can I help you, how can I support you, be more comfortable being uncomfortable. Many students shy away from those uncomfortable feelings, whether it's anxiety or anger or sadness, kind of that's, in my mind, the trifecta of uncomfortable feelings. And we want to build their ability to, to stay with that discomfort, to tolerate feeling a little bit anxious, to tolerate feeling a little bit annoyed with other people, because again, that's what's going to pull them forward in their ability to cooperate. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about and describe two particular fabulous YouTube videos and kind of paint a picture for you. I'm hoping that later today, 
or this week or over the weekend at some point, you'll get a chance to call up a couple of these videos and be able to have a look and pull it up in front of your family with your kids, take a look at it and enjoy it. They're really absolutely fabulous stories. So the first one, this was nominated for an Academy Award, Catch It by Esma. And this is just the sweetest story in which a lovely little group of meerkats are admiring this beautiful fruit hanging in a tree. And then they scuttle away because a vulture has come, kind of the ugliest vulture you could ever imagine. And, of course, he takes the fruit and flies away. And so first, these little meerkats are sad, and you can tell that they feel worried and a little bit frustrated and annoyed. And then they decide, wait a minute, we're not going to put up with this. We're going to work together and try and get this fruit back. We're not going to just take this. We've got to get that fruit back. And so they take off after this vulture. And the story that unfolds is just lovely. The music is great. The expressions of both these meerkats and the vulture are just absolutely adorable. Kind of has a surprise ending. Again, not every YouTube has a perfect ending, just like not every moment in life has a perfect happy ending. But it's a great way to talk about these little guys really worked together. They had obstacles. What was it that had they, how did they know to stay with their group plan? There's one little meerkat in the beginning who's holding back a little bit. He's not so sure he wants to do this. But then he goes along with the group. He's flexible. It's a great example of flexibility, a great example of managing different feelings. You can talk about how did these meerkats feel. Well, they felt sad and they felt frustrated, but they felt determined and they felt happy and they felt successful and they felt disappointed. It's just this great medley of feelings. So it's a great way to talk about different feelings that happen when we're trying to work together or when things don't go the way we want. The second YouTube I'm recommending this morning is actually a little news clip. This is called Neighbors Helping Neighbors After the Storm by the Washington Post. And it shows a neighborhood in which a tree has fallen on a car and people in the community come together with their chainsaws and they're just sawing the tree apart to take it apart while they're talking about the storm. And this is a really nice real life example of working together. And when I showed this with students, we really talked about that sometimes cooperation is inconvenient to us. Kids were saying things like, but what if the, what if the playoffs were on? What if the playoffs are on and here this tree is falling on my neighbor's car? Do I really have to go out there to help? What if it's lunchtime? What if I have sensory challenges and I don't want to get scratched by branches? We had a wonderful discussion of what it means to help others what it means to be kind, how difficult it can be to cooperate, how we might feel this initial resentment that we don't want to do it, but then how we can stick with it and stay with the cooperative task. And it's a great way of just opening up our conversation with our kids about what it means to cooperate, whether it's in a classroom or whether it's in a home situation, because just as cooperation is important at school, it's also cooperation is important at home. And the more we can get along as a family, the easier it is, whether we're at the dinner table or whether we're at, on a vacation or whether we're going to the movies and deciding what movie to go see. So there'll be a link at the end of this broadcast referring you to uh, a document that has more great YouTube recommendations about cooperation. I encourage you to check them all out. They're all great in their own way. Make sure you preview them before you show them to your kids because you want to make sure it's a good fit for your family. But let's take a little time to talk about what it means not to get along and what that can look like. And there's also great YouTubes to, to show our family members about what that looks like to start those discussions. Animal Instincts by Guru Animation. Make sure you look at it before you show your kids. Again, not every YouTube is perfect for every family. And Animal Instincts is a better choice for older kids rather than younger kids, in my mind. And The Bridge by Ting Chante is also another lovely story 
in which two characters don't get along about a problem they face, and then two characters face exactly the same problem, and they cooperate and they get through it. So it's a nice little contrast. When I work with students, I often use marker boards and visual supports and write down what we're brainstorming. And I encourage families to do that also because you want to be able to kind of summarize, wow, look at all these great ideas we came up with. And so sometimes I'll talk to kids and say, what does it mean to be a team? Or I work with siblings and parents sometimes together. We'll talk about, well, what does teamwork look like? And we'll make a list. And so a list might look like, well, it means being flexible, respecting everyone's ideas, make sure everyone is involved, include everyone's plans, let everyone speak, work together, and know your limits and strengths. Just one example of a set of descriptors that one family was able to come up with. Another reason to write this down is we can also take a picture of it with our great phones and then have it as reminders. So if we're going into... Uh, an airport. All right, we're going to be a team at the airport. Let's remember we made this list two weeks ago. Let's check it out. Let's remember. Let's try and keep this in our minds as we're going on this great adventure of a vacation. Sometimes I'll ask everyone to write something down, and it's always great to get all these different ideas. So as a child was saying, when everybody except one person agrees to something and that person is too stubborn, Okay, there's a great feeling stubbornness enters into cooperating or not. And the realization that teamwork doesn't work when everyone has different ideas. Boy, that really sums it up. That is so true. Now, one thing that I really like to do is to also, and we'll talk about this more when we get to games, is talk about kind of strategies ahead of time, previewing a task and reminding ourselves that collaborating can be easy when we communicate. And so, for example, when, if, when we were doing a puzzle in a group, we talked about what kind of things can we say. Let's plan ahead. That If you're saying, well, I'm working on this part, and letting people know what puzzle pieces you're looking for. You know, does anybody have? Reminding that when someone hands you a puzzle piece you need, you can say thank you. Here we go. Did you find? Oh, I think that goes over there. I think you needed it. Reminding ourselves before we start a task what we want to be doing in the moment. Again, with our students, we're trying to set them up for success. We're trying to remind ourselves ahead of time, oh, that's right, this is what I want to be doing. You know, I often do that when I'm cooking. I think ahead. If I'm having a dinner party, I plan ahead. And it's the same thing when we're planning a family outing or we're getting ready for the beginning of school, to have those conversations looking into the future. Sarah Ward, the queen of, of executive function, would say, put on your future goggles and think ahead. What are you going to need to know on the first day of school? How can we set up our students to collaborate and cooperate as we're getting out the door on that first day, planning ahead? And again, writing some things down, making some sketches so we all have those reminders. Sometimes it's great to have a reminder that we can look at to see how are we doing. And so when I have groups working on play together, and whether it's a group of young kids doing some Lego building or some older kids doing some snap circuits together, again, to have that visual support. And a lot of families use this with siblings. And so how are we sharing our imagination? How are we doing on that? Hmm. Are we all doing our own plans by ourselves, separately? That doesn't sound like cooperation. Or are we doing good? Are we trying to fit our ideas together, but it's still tricky to stay flexible? Or, yay, all right, we're working together flexibly, sharing imagination. So sometimes stopping for a moment and think, okay, how are we doing right now with our drive to Vermont? Uh, I think we're kind of doing okay. We're a little bit, there's a little bit of, of uncomfortable talking happening in that back seat. All right, let's see if we can get it up to really working together. Let's get some snacks out or maybe try and do some, some YouTube watching to see if we can get back on track. That sense that we can always get back on track, that we can always try and make things get back to where we really want them to be. 
just like we can sit around and brainstorm with our family members about what it means to cooperate, we can also brainstorm about reasons for not getting along. And students, I find, are always have great ideas about what it means to not get along. Again, writing these down. So if we generate a list that sounds like, well, not listening, people are in bad moods. Maybe people have different ideas. Oh, maybe someone wants to win or be the best or think that the other people or rules are stupid and issues of flexibility and wanting it your way. Great to make a list of this because then we can also talk about feelings. What feelings happen when, we're, when we have these ideas? So a reminder to parents, I think, is we certainly want to help students articulate how they're feeling and what they're thinking and what they want and what their frustration might be or what their plan is. But remember to push their perspective taking skills to stop for a minute and think about how the other person. So oftentimes, maybe take that pause before you tell your child how you feel or what you think. Take a pause and say, how do you think I'm feeling right now? Can you guess how I'm feeling right now? Do you have any idea what I'm thinking right now? And really encourage them to make that pause and think about the other person. Because again, for lots of students with ADHD, their perspective taking can be a little shaky, especially in the moment when they're feeling uncomfortable. Again, if you want more YouTube recommendations, I have a Google Doc available. I have a website that has links to other great YouTube recommendations for feelings of anger, feelings of sadness. And so feel free, if you're listening to this as a podcast, go to the slides, get the downloaded uh, Google Doc, and check out. There's lots of great stories on YouTube. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can use the power of games to work on cooperation. And games have gotten so fabulous right now. We're so lucky to live at a time that have that game producers, game creators are making incredible tabletop games. We'll talk a little bit at the very end about great video games. There's cooperative games and there's uh, games where an individual works and they're all very, very powerful. Let's, let's talk for a minute about all the different skills that we can work with our students on when we're playing games. And so it's a lot about agreeing and negotiating. You have to, first of all, agree what game to play. Some games have an opportunity for casual conversation. Not all of them, but certainly some of them do. Resilience is something we mentioned at the beginning of our conversation today. And games allow students to practice taking risks and practicing feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Flexibility, flexibility enters into many, many games and we can practice being flexible. Staying engaged. If we're playing a board game, if it's not your turn, you should, you should still be paying attention. If I have to remind you every time, well, get your nose out of your book, honey, it's your turn now. That person is not really engaged in the active and the social component of games and we can encourage them to practice that tolerating the opinions of others, doing what's expected in a game, accepting mistakes. Sometimes in games we make a mistake or we get a bad role. Staying regulated, again, managing those uncomfortable feelings. Sometimes in a game we get the wonderful opportunity to get to apologize for having said something that we maybe shouldn't have said or making a wrong move or doing something that made somebody feel upset. Overall, real opportunity to practice feeling uncomfortable, to think about feelings. So games give us all incredible opportunities that we can really take advantage of in a fun way. So many different feelings come with playing games. Yes, we want them to be fun. We want to feel happy. But again, most games give us the opportunities to feel that trifecta of uncomfortable feelings, sadness, anger, and worry. Maybe we're behind. Maybe we don't want someone to catch up and take over the lead. Maybe we're getting bad roles. It's really just a wealth of opportunity to practice being uncomfortable. It's great sometimes we talked about having visuals, writing things down. And just like it's great to write down those lists of, you know, we're heading into the airport, how are we going to cooperate? It can be very helpful to have little cues about, well, we're going to play a game 
well, if, it's, if, if things don't go our way, we want to remember it's just a game. Maybe we'll get a better role next time. Yeah, that's good enough. It doesn't have to be great. Not a big deal. And sometimes just having these up, we don't even have to say them. Just prop them up on the kitchen table next to where you're playing the game. And you can model using these also. You can say, man, I can't believe I got two ones in a row. Oh, um, oh, oh well, you know, it's just a game. You're modeling using these great game playing fixtures and stock fixtures. I even have some Little League coaches, coaches that have posted these in the dugout because heaven knows Little League players sometimes need these reminders. Planning ahead for games. Again, think ahead. We're going to play the game of life or we're going to play, oh, my gosh, sorry. Wow, some people might feel mad. Some people might feel sad. Some people might get nervous. What are we going to do when that happens? We can remember to just take a moment, take a breath, read the room, eat some popcorn, have those strategies at the ready. So not only can you be reminded that you've got a plan for when things start going south a little bit, but your kids will know that also. Playing a video game, same thing. I don't know what to do. How, if many of you have maybe not played video games with your kids, in a few slides we're going to talk about great video games. Because sometimes that's where our students, our kids shine at video games. They can use those controllers amazingly. And we get on and we're like, I don't know. What do I do? I just don't know what I'm doing here. Great to model for our students how being resilient means not quitting, saying, okay, you tr okay teach me again. I want to try again. I have lots of game recommendations. There's fabulous games to learn about each other. There's dice games. There's card games. Just this great wealth of fabulous, fabulous games. As an example, Hanabi is a game, a cooperative game where you're building fireworks together. The trick is you see everyone's cards but your own. It's just an amazing game, and there are lots and lots of game recommendations on both of these slides. Again, if you're just listening and you need some new games, the Spice Up Family Game Nights, go to the website, download the slides, and take a look at these two slides that have cooperative game recommendations, competitive game recommendations. Again, remember, prime for success before playing. Make those posters. Make those lists about feelings. Get your game playing fixture thought bubbles out there so that you and your kids can remember to think it's just a game, it's fine. I do have lots of video game recommendations. I'm really a fan of the Kinect the Xbox 360 Connect games, that's where you, when you move, the avatar moves. There are really wonderful sports. I like a lot of the sport games. I had some kids just the other day doing uh, that squirrel suit diving off the Himalayas. They were having a great time. They were practicing being resilient. They got me to try it, so I was able to demonstrate my fear of heights, my uncertainty. We were all laughing. We were all having a really, really wonderful time with this. So just some final thoughts about this. These YouTube videos and games can really draw kids in. You don't necessarily have to try and rope them in from the beginning and say, okay, we're all going to sit down and watch some YouTube videos about cooperation. Just turn them on when your kids are in the side of the monitor or the TV, and I bet they'll come over. They're going to slink over, and then you can talk about them and maybe get some conversation starting. Remember how difficult cooperation can be for some of our kids. So we do have to be really, really patient and understand that cooperation is very complicated for them. Having a difficult moment, you know, try and fight that urge to get in there and verbally try and mediate. Give everyone a chance to settle down, to calm a little bit and then come back together and see if you can do some brainstorming or some checking. So this is it for my slides. Susan, I'm Great. going to turn Thank it you. back okay. over to you. Thanks so much. It's really, really interesting. I want to invite the listeners to post their questions and specifically tell us what your child's social skill issues are that you, you'd like to have um, our speaker address, and um, we're ready to take some questions. So, um, Anna, there's one interesting question here from 
from uh, Deanna, and she says, my son just turned nine, and we've been, I feel like we've been working on social issues for years. Is there a window of opportunity to teach ki- these skills to our kids? Are, are we too late? Um, what's your feeling on timing of social skill intervention? No, Deanna, I don't think you're too late at all. I see, you know, now that I've gotten older, I don't see as many three- and four-year-olds. I'm seeing lots of young adults. And some of the young adults that come into my office have had a lot of intervention, and some of them have not, and it is not too late. I think, you know, and I, and I do think that there's a lot that we're trying to, to work with. There's, there's so, the, the need can be so great. I think it's also always good to start with expanding and checking a child's feeling vocabulary. How, how is your child at understanding and coding feelings? It's very difficult to get through life only knowing sad, mad, and happy. We really need to diversify students' feeling vocabulary because a lot of social challenges, in my mind, come down to feeling. And if you only know mad and you're not very good with frustrated, annoyed, furious, all those diverse vocabulary words that fall under the bigger umbrella of anger, it's going to be challenging. And so when I've been doing my work on social learning and using media, using movies, and more recently using YouTube, my, the, the book that came out on YouTube started with feelings, because I think it's so critical for students to understand feelings and that people have feelings. We often, I think, go to a student's uncomfortable feelings early on. That's where we kind of zero in on. And that can make students uncomfortable. It's hard for most of us to talk about when we feel mad, when we feel sad. And so I'm a big believer in helping students talk about when characters might feel sad or mad, starting to look at a great video like Ormy the Pig, one of my favorites, or... uh, Shell Game, Yushin Lee's Shell Game is a great YouTube where this great little lobster uh, is under the sea and he, he wants to try this crown of the shell, but then he runs into some trouble. And I always want to see if I stop the YouTube, how does this student code the feeling? Does he understand the feeling? Does he understand the thought that might go with that feeling? If there are two characters in a YouTube, such as Sesame Street, Ernie Counts Fruit, where Bert and Ernie have two very different things going on. Can a student uh, differentiate, well, Ernie is feeling fine, but Bert is feeling frustrated? Because that looks at perspective taking. How is this kiddo able to sort perspective in a YouTube? We can build that skill set for feelings and for understanding relationships between characters, then students often say, I felt like that also, or that happened to me too. And then they're ready to go into that self-reflection. So just a couple ideas. Yeah, interesting. Um, There are a number of listeners who have children who are older, uh, high school students, and they're wondering whether um, the YouTube suggestions in, in the Google Doc or on your site are organized by age. And specifically, I guess, whether you have any suggestions for great videos for uh, 13, 14, 15-year-old boys, it sounds like many times. You know, I do have the, the, the Google Doc only has 10 YouTubes on it, and I have about 300 in my library. So there's lots to choose from. I would uh, encourage you to look at the Google Doc and look at some of those and see what you think. I think okay. that sometimes even those high school students if, if you're watching it, they will probably come over and they may scoff at it, but they may also still look at it and pick some things up from it. I think the Neighbors Helping Neighbors After the Storm is certainly great for college student, for high school students. There are even some Minecraft, although I know Minecraft now is, is not the most popular with high school students, but there are even some gaming videos that high school students find appealing. So I think high school students are in some ways harder to rope into anything. Right, uh, exactly, yeah. Um, it's an interesting number of questions um, around the topic of helping children with 
um, how can I I'll find one of these, um, with interactions with other kids that are not positive. So whether they're bullying or they're approaching another child and they're not um, uh, well received, um, how do you help your child um, deal, talk about um, interactions with kids who they, they wish they were friends with, but they're not? Mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. is the question. Well, that's a very complicated and big challenge. Right. In yeah. social learning, I think what I always encourage parents to do is to try and get their kids to draw things out. And I'm a big fan of dry erase boards because they're easier than paper and pencil. A lot of kids are not so keen on paper and pencil, but if you give them a marker board and some dry erase markers, they're, they're pretty willing to draw out what happened that may not have gone well. Mm -hmm. Because that picture will give us a starting point to which then we can say, oh, wow, you know, can you add some thought bubbles? What were you thinking? What was the other person saying? How do you think that person was feeling? How were you feeling? And then perhaps even say, let's draw another board of what happened next or what happened before. Because what we want is to try and get a sense of the whole event. The reason you want your student to draw it out is that this will keep the information in their working memory. Because when it comes to social, talking it through will not work. You have to have a visual representation to remind the student what they said happened. Also keeps it from turning into, but you told me, blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. If they've drawn it out, we just have to point to it and say, yeah, right here, it looked like you told me that this happened. And so I think drawing is really important. I think often we as parents jump to giving suggestions in a strong voice, like net tomorrow you should, or why didn't you? And I think sometimes if we can be more indirect, saying, I wonder what you could do about this tomorrow. I wonder if you've got any ideas and make it more of a collaborative problem solving. Because as Ross Green says, this is a lot about lagging skills and unsolved problems. And mm -hmm. the more we can make it a collaborative discussion, the, more, the higher the likelihood is, is that we'll actually get some discussion with our students. Because remember, these are really tough issues for them to discuss. They want to get it right. They desperately want to have friends. It's a real challenge. But again, I think the starting point is to try and get them to draw what their reality is. Okay, that makes sense. That's, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, here's an interesting set of questions. A number of people um, listening are saying that um, their child is very focused on YouTube, even obsessed. Or here's one, someone whose nine-year-old wakes up and immediately wants to go for to TV, to iPad. Um, another says, what about YouTube addiction? For parents who are dealing with how to manage screen time, how how do they um, how, any suggestions on on that topic in and of itself, I suppose, but and then also how in that context do they use YouTube? Do they suggest YouTube for social training? You know, I think the limits around YouTube are very is a is a huge challenge for families and. I have to say that whenever, and I get this question all the time, and my brain always goes to, I'm so happy my kids are grown. I know. Because I, know. I think it is a huge, huge issue. You know, yes, I think YouTube has a lot to offer, but yes, I also think that screen time is really, really such an issue for parents and for, and for kids. I think that you know, using parental controls on all of our parental controllable devices of how do you cut off the Internet in your house? How do you do that? How do you keep, a big question is how do we keep on top of these kids who are so tech savvy? Right. That it's hard to stay a step ahead of them with even passwords because they're so good at getting around them. And so I think that this is, we're in a period of time right now where you know, the pendulum is all over the place. The pendulum has not yet been able to determine. We have the kind of this monster of electronics. How are we going to balance it in our lives? And so I think we're in 
a number of years worth of trying to sort this out, of yeah. trying to figure out how are we going to do this. Families, I, th- I think families do have to, within their home, start by having discussions about this and making it as, again, collaborative as you can with the understanding that when kids get into that flow experience of video gaming, their brain is in a different place. They're having an experience that can be very difficult to get them out of. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any easy answers for that. Right. But I do think the place to start is with the parental controls, making your, uh, your phone stacks, At the dinner table, everyone stack your phone upside down, and you do not touch your phone. And that's just how our family operates. And I think part of it is modeling our own electronic use. You know, so if I am uh, waiting at a restaurant to be seated with my family, I do not have to be on my phone. I can be. And I have to remind myself, nope, I'm with my family. I'm, my phone is not coming out right now. Right. And I think it, we, we really have to, it gives us an opportunity to talk about in our family what's important. Right. Um, yeah, I think you're right about modeling this. Where the screen addiction is a problem for all of us adults and children. But um, um, Chelsea's asking something that I, I also wondered about. Are, are you saying that, YouTube video board games can be helpful when parents are involved. In other words, I think you're, you're, you're not saying that the kids should be doing these things independently. And could you describe a little scenario where you, how you might see a parent um, playing a YouTube video in order to have a social skills discussion? Do you stop it to have a discussion? Do you wait till it's over? I mean, some sort of how to practical, um, mm-hmm. practically, sure. how does it work? Absolutely. I would, I, I, I think what we've talked about today is, in, is having parents and kids either do watching the YouTubes together or playing the games together. Although certainly there's lots of game recommendations on those slides that siblings, you know, can play. Mm-hmm. Certainly kids can play these great games by themselves. So a scenario for the parent playing a video would be you, you could watch just the whole thing and see if your, kid, if your student comes over. So if you're watching ESMA, I can pretty much guarantee that most kids will come over and watch it and say, wow, you know, I think I missed a few things. I'm going to watch it again or then stop it and say, well, you know, I, I think I want to just stop this whole, you know, what did you think about that? Mm-hmm. There's no rule to how you watch a YouTube together. And that's part of the challenge is you have to kind of go with what's happening in the moment. You might all be so enraptured by watching Ormy the Pig that you just let it play and you're laughing together and you're enjoying it together. And that's part of what we want to do as a family is have a good time and enjoy being together doing something. But then you can also have that conversation even at a later time. So if you've watched Ormy the Pig, which I recommend for absolutely everybody, and then at the dinner table, you could say, you know, and I was thinking about Ormy the Pig again today because I was at the grocery store and I was frustrated that I couldn't find a parking space. And and Ormy just came into mind. Or if you're... uh, playing some game and you didn't get what you wanted the first time, you could even relate back to the video and say, you know what, this reminds me of asthma. And just like those meerkats would not let that vulture take their fruit, I'm going to, I'm still going to try and, and and get a farkle or I'm going to next time see if I can calculate a way to send you home or something like that to then take some of the lessons that are in the YouTube videos and apply them in other situations. Be reminded, oh my gosh, this is just like Army the Pig, but I'm not going to give up on trying to make this pie crust right or something like that. Mm-hmm. So again, making those connections. But yes, I think whether you're watching as a parent alone, encourage kids to come in. And with the same with the video games, play, and this is what many experts on uh, video games are saying, play the games with your students, even if they are third-person shooter games. If you have it in your home, try playing it. That lets you know what the game is about. That lets your student know that you're watching what they're doing. 
It lets them know that you're open to seeing it. And then that can open the door to those discussions of, I really kind of feel uncomfortable about this game. And mm-hmm. see what your student has, to, what your child has to say in response. Start those conversations together. Okay. A um, couple of questions about eye contact. Um, how to encourage a child to um, use eye co- contact during conversations. And a couple of listeners who, who are frustrated by their child's inability to, to make contact even after many conversations about, about the importance of it. About eye contact. Yeah. I think it's important for children to understand why is eye contact important? It's not just the behavior of eye contact. Eye contact is important because it shows that you're thinking about the other person. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking to someone, and remember that if we're having an uncomfortable conversation, less eye contact would kind of be expected. It's really hard to maintain eye contact with people if we're feeling like we're being excuse me, called on the carpet for something, or if we're talking about a difficult subject. Again, we can think about, well, when you're talking to, when I'm talking to my spouse, how much eye contact am I having with him, really? And to remind ourselves that eye contact, again, is contextually variable. There are times when there's more eye contact. There are times when there's less eye contact. But nonetheless, we can say to our kids, you know what, I'm not sure you're thinking about me. I'm not sure because your eyes aren't thinking about me. And again, to notice, especially with with kiddos who are just practicing this, wow, I really noticed how your eyes were thinking about me. That was so terrific. We need to notice when our students are doing what we want them to be doing and to compliment them on that. But then again, we can also remind them, remember grandma's coming over. Remember, you want to really think about her with her eyes. That'll give her really good thoughts about you. Reminding our students, again, that little heads-up preview that grandma, it's really nice to think about grandma with your eyes. It makes her feel so great that that's, again, the reason we want our students doing many of these kind of basic social behaviors is because it makes people, it gives people good thoughts about us. And we Mm -hmm. can remind our students that that's the reason why this is important. Okay, that sounds makes sense. Um, interesting question here from Andrea wants to know your opinion about um, online peer groups. She said her 14-year-old has tremendous social issues in person, but he's found a group of kids he consistently plays with online and has discovered that most of them have ADHD. She said it's hard for her to listen to because it's the one place where they all seem to let their hyperactivity, loud behavior fly. Is it is this encouraging a lack of control or is it, the one, the one place where he can really be himself. She's wondering if she should be encouraging this or discouraging this peer, online peer group behavior. Well, from what you've described as Andrea saying, it doesn't sound like there is, it, it sounds like a positive experience. Mm-hmm. I think you do need to supervise it and make sure that everything is going, you know, is going okay. It sounds like her child is having a good experience. And I think ultimately what we want is we want in, in, in many situations to be with people who are like us, who believe what we believe in, who enjoy what we enjoy, who, and who accept us as we are. And whereas, it, you know, I certainly can understand how it would be, you know, challenging to eavesdrop on a group that's doing this because it may be very, very stimulating. <laughs> again, you know, it sounds like for her child, again, if, She's supervising it to the degree that, okay, it's a, it's a bunch of hyper kids, but they're all having a good hyper time together. Uh, you know, as our kids get older, we do have less and less control over what they do, and, and we want them to understand how to be safe. And so I think having those conversations of how do you stay safe online in online peer groups, what, are, what do you look for as uh, you know, cautions, what, what does possible trouble online look like? I mm-hmm. think those are important discussions to have. Um, but as long as it's a safe place and her child feels good, I think that's ultimately what we want is to feel good. We want our kids right. to feel good. Um, it's interesting finding peer groups online and, and how how to translate that to the, to the real world is, you know, it's, it's a really a challenge, I think, for many parents of kids who spend a lot of time gaming. Um, 
Melissa says she's phrasing uh, a question in one way that is echoed by others. She says her 12 year old son is super easily um, offended. He takes offense at all sorts of things, comments that are not intended to hurt him. Um, How, how do we help him understand others' intentions? Yes. In some ways, this kind of goes back to the question about, you know, bullying and helping students with general mm-hmm. interactions. I would, Melissa, I would suggest that you ask your students to, your, your, your son to draw out an example. And okay. I suspect he probably will be very willing to do that uh, because he feels offended by it. And then see if you can sort out what does he think is in the, the, the thought bubble of the other person. Okay, because that's interesting. Because he may be misinterpreting intention. Right. And so a question is, did the other student mean to intend him or to offend him or did he not? And again, to talk about feeling size and to talk about what's going on between people. So uh, even watching a YouTube like the one that I referenced, uh, The Bridge, you can talk about intention. What do those characters mean? What are they each thinking to see whether, well, what is, does the other person intend for you to be offended Mm -hmm. or are you having a bigger feeling in response to something that the other student really didn't mean for you to have a big feeling and reaction to? So again, I think it's about, figuring out thoughts and feelings of yourself and the other person. That's interesting. There's another person here who's posted something, which I think also shows the the issue of intention. She says, my son's nine years old. He constantly blames other for his actions. Um, I've tried to get him to be self more self-aware. She's characterizing it as self-awareness, but I think what you're saying is he may not understand in, the intentions of others around him. Yes, um, and understanding yes. the, the plans that people have and what they're doing. And, and I really am such a strong believer in having students draw out these situations. Mm-hmm. And often they'll use one color and then I'll say, can I add to your picture? Can we figure out thoughts and feelings? And right. that's really where students struggle. Uh, because when I say, well, what's the other, what, what was the other kid on the playground feeling? And they're really not sure. Right. And then thinking about, well, what were they doing? What was going on? But again, if we're trying to just talk our way through brainstorming about this, it really, I find, is much less effective because there's just so much information to keep track of. Right. And our kiddos really benefit from having it drawn and and so they can look at it they can watch Mm -hmm. it and you'll see them just looking at these pictures as they're trying to figure these complicated social events out right um social anxiety there are a number of people who say their children have a really hard time with any kind of small chat talk or conversation in groups um any strategies that you use for dealing with that kind of social anxiety and small talk talk issue Small talk is very challenging. It and I is. Think we had, I think we had a, a, a webinar a couple years ago on conversation. We did, uh, yeah. We did. Uh, I think you know, part of small talk, the issue that many kids have is small talk depends on caring about things that you really don't know about and may not really think much about. And so it's really building the skill set of asking questions and understanding why do we have small talk? What's the purpose of small talk? <laughs> you know, it's to start deeper conversations, but it's also to get to know people to see if you have anything in common. So it's kind of a time to be a detective and find out about other people to see, you know, what do we have in common? But I think working on conversation and small talk is another huge chunk of social learning that mm-hmm. as a speech language pathologist, I work on quite a lot. Uh, because the, it does bring up anxiety in students, especially how do you talk to people that you don't know? And so <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's really hard for kids. But I think what you said about understanding why it's important is really key, because I think some kids, you're, I think you're right, some kids just don't understand why one should talk about nothing, basically, right? Yeah, why would it's, I talk yeah. about something I don't care about? It right, no right, <laughs> right. 
So interesting. Yeah. Um, someone just posted there. Eight, there's an article called Eight Ways to Get Better at Small Talk on the Attitude website by Gretchen Rubin. Thank you, Chelsea, for yes, posting I that. See, I've seen that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's really good at Gretchen Rubin at, um, at these kinds of issues. Oh, here's a great one. Which this, this question from Anne comes up so, so often. Um, how do I prompt my 13-year-old to get away from the screen and video gaming and, quote, get outside and make friends or basically do something else than sit in front of a computer? Oh, my gosh. That's a big question. I know. Ah, uh, uh, wow. Uh, I think I think it's it's a real challenge. I guess part of it is setting those limits around time mm -hmm. and then really trying, again, to have – some kind of a collaborative discussion. What can we do together? What do we like to do? You know, some kids will want to go to the grocery store. Some kids will be on board for kayaking. Yeah. And that, that's that been a suggestion. Is, yeah. Find something your child's passionate about, right? Which I think is hard, but yeah, seems to be the key. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, I think we're out of time. This was so interesting. I want to remind everyone that Anna Vegan's website is socialtime.org and also invite you to check out Play Attention, um, which is offering a special discount for uh, on their social skills module. And Anna, thank you so much for all your the work that you've done with us and for, for kids. And I hope everyone will check out Anna's website and find many more wonderful resources. So oh, thank you welcome, all. Susan. And we'll see you at our next webinar, which is next Tuesday on August 21st on IEPs and 504s, which I think is a perennial issue at this time of year. Um, and we have two great uh, speakers who are real pros at navigating the IEP 504 um, framework. So hope to see, hear you all then. And thank, thank you again, Anna. Bye, everyone.